وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما تحب وترضى بن صلي عليه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم علمني ما ينفعني وانفعني بما علمتني وزدني علما اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته we are the last portion of surah al kahf and hopefully inshallah ta'ala even if you don't engage in a lengthy discussion today we'll try and cover as much as we can in terms of the, of the last few verses and the very very important verses as well so we'll try and do a little bit of in-depth discussion on it inshallah ta'ala and then we'll conclude surah al kahf and next week inshallah ta'ala Allah willing we'll start off with the subject of love in the holy quran right can you only hear me now is it okay better okay um, Just get somebody to read from where we left for the last time. Bismillah. Yeah. Sorry. Did the Quran open? Last few verses. Kullu kana al-bahru midada li-kalimat Rabbi. The last two verses. Last two verses. Yeah. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the final verse of Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the vastness and the infinite vastness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decrees. Now if you were to If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is putting a challenge across, he said, oh, Prophet of Allah informed them. If they were to try to, to, to collect, or if they were trying to start writing and recording, and in some, some way whatsoever, trying to archive, or try to, try to calculate, or for, that, or for that matter, try to now, you know, um, encapsulate all of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of and all the if all of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be were to be put down on paper, so to speak, then you would need an ocean of ink, and even an ocean if you brought one more ocean like it, it won't be enough. And then another verse of the Holy Prophet says, and if all the, the trees on planet earth were to be turned into pens, and if you were to bring seven oceans put together, right, to continue putting to words the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and putting down on paper the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the maqdurat, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed, right, the ahkamat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the seven oceans can't come close in any way whatsoever in even trying to, to record whatever is in the world and whatever is in the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just to give you an idea, I mean, leave the universe on one side, right? The fact that every single living organism in this universe, this observable universe and the non-observable universe, which is far more vast than this observable universe, which is so big in the first place, Right? is directly under the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, under the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing can exist without the absolute power and without the absolute control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this entire universe. You know what, just thinking about it, right, puts, a, you know, puts almost like a barrier into your mind. You say, you know what, it's, it's beyond comprehension. It's beyond comprehension. And here is man as insignificant, as puny as he is, right? Making a claim, I am God most high. Gee, sorry, are you in, in charge of the rotation of the sun? Are you in charge of this galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, in which all the planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus, with all of their qualities, with all of their attributes, with all the heat, with all the temperature, with all the hydrogen, the helium, you name it. Are you in charge of it? Any, anything whatsoever. How is it that man who is so insignificant in himself, as well as being insignificant in the universe, right, even more insignificant in the universe, can even make a claim of being God? Why? Because of free will? Really? Because of free will? How much of free will? I mean, you know, we talk about democracy and freedom of speech and everything. Everything is limited, Baba. 
Your free will is even worse than that. Your free will is even worse than that. You can't willfully decide when your kidney is going to start functioning and when your kidney must stop functioning. That's not in your control. That's not in your control. No, basically speaking, I'm talking about this on the fundamentals here. And you can pick up one hand, you can pick up one leg. That's it. You can pick up the other hand, fine. No, you can't pick up the second leg. Khalas. It's beyond your capacity. Not even Dave Blaine. What, what's the guy that named that? that uh, David Blaine. Yeah. I don't think he's going to even do that either. Right? You can't do it. Forget about it. Not that it is impossible. Because the same capacity has been given to birds. They pick up their wings and they pick up their feet. And what happens? They start flying. You and I try to observe, we're going to fall flat on the head. We regard ourselves as the greatest of human beings. Did you ever, did you ever hear right, a rumble in the jungle? Not Ali and Freya. What's his name? Ali and what is his name? Yes. Not, not Freya. Freya. Foreman. Foreman in uh, rumble in the jungle. You ever heard of world war in jungle? Did you ever hear that the, the, the pride of lions are taking on the on uh, taking on the buffaloes? Or the pride of lions are taking let's take it let's make it a little bit more equal the hippos. Most dangerous animal on earth is a hippo. So did you ever hear world war? All the hippos of planet Earth are coming together and they're declaring war against the <laughs> Kind of lions out there to see who's king of the jungle. Even animals don't have that degree of barbarity. Do you understand? And here we are. No animal yet has claimed being God. No other species on planet Earth, or for that matter in the universe, has claimed to be God except this puny human being. Right? And we want to run the universe. Baba, if you were to just count the amount of hair on your body, the amount of cells and organisms in your own body, the amount of bacteria in your body, all of that which is being sustained from this human body, which is a marvel on its own, of which you have plus minus 0 0.000001 control, if you have any of that as well, you'll, re you'll, re you'll realize what is kalimat rabbi, what it means to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then you was going to put your head down. Wallah, put your head down. Right? They are something like, you know, the brain performs something like two gigaflops a nanosecond just for your eyes to see. Just for the process of sight to be affected. Two gigaflops in a nanosecond. And what are we talking about? Ajay, I'm in control of that. No, I'm in control. And this is why, you know, <laughs> let's not even count those things. These are the, the Zahiri things, you know, that this is within our body. Leave alone, leave alone the rest of the universe out there, which we have no control over at all. So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. And this is what is the greatest challenge to humanity in terms of man's lack of knowledge and man's ignorance. Ignorance about himself, ignorance of the universe. Because he's so caught up in his own bubble of his own so-called perceived consciousness. What did I say? Perceived consciousness. That he believes I am like that. This, this is I am. Where are you? Where are you? Right? When they started to figure out themselves because they don't submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. So, so, so what happens to Rene Descartes and all of these people? That if you end up with a slight brain injury, right? And some of your function of your brain stops. What does that mean? You don't exist anymore. <laughs> You, 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 you know, Imam Ghazali, I, I used this example before. Imam Ghazali says, man thinks he's so great. But let one be stinging, tiny bee like this, with a small, you know, uh, uh, you know thing, just to, to prick him like that day, and he'd be in pain, screaming, and shouting all over the place. Right? Man thinks he's so great, he's so beautiful, right, that Allah has created him in this form here. Just take off that skin and see how ugly you are. Right? Man thinks he's so great, he's got so much of aqal, but if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one way or the other were to diminish his brain capacity through a stroke or, or through a brain tumor or whatever it is, that active thinking human being that regarded himself as great because he could think, because he was aware of himself, will lose all, all sense of consciousness, will lose all sense of awareness, will all lose, lose, lose all sense of being. He won't have any idea who he is. That man. Right? And if man is so great out there, ask him what a system he's got inside. This is Imam Ghazali's words, I've used it before, forgive me for it. He's a walking toilet. He's literally a walking toilet. He stores all of his feces inside his stomach before he's taken out. Really. You walk in with Najis and Napaki in you and really, you great, you God. This is, this is the greatest, you know, Himakati, in Urdu they call it Himakati, absolute ignorance. And you know, uh, you know, being a duffer of the highest order, when human beings come out there to claim God, or oh, God doesn't exist. God 
doesn't exist by virtue of what all science told me that. Right? Oh, no, 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 uh, what you call it? Uh, evolution told me that. Theory of evolution told me that. Right? Who told me that? Richard Dawkins told me that. Right? Who's Richard Dawkins? Yeah, the, 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 you know, the, 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 what was his name? The, the, the God, what was it? Uh, Richard Dawkins. God delusion. Hmm? God delusion. No, no, God delusion. Yeah, yeah Richard Dawkins, the God delusion. Yeah, yeah, I've tried to go. Yeah. Now, no, no, not down. Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins got it. You know, he wrote a, what's your crazy idea? There's, there's a book which published annually. So Richard Dawkins' crazy idea was that we need to bridge the gap, bridge the gap between the human species and the and primates. You know, the, you know the, the apes and so on. Because there is that 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 bridge which needs to be in, because for the past two, three, four, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand years or whatever it is, there, the gap hasn't been bridged. Uh, apes still remain apes, chimpanzees remain chimpanzees, although they have the same similar brain capacity, they have similar society, they have similar traits of human beings or whatever it is, there, and at times they are far more intelligent than human beings. So he said the idea would be that if you want to bridge the whole thing, this is the man talking about the God delusion, right? If you want to bridge the gap there, human beings should now start engaging in relationship with, 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 with apes and chimpanzees and you know, orangutans and uh, what do you call it, baboons and whatever, you know, all of those species there, so that if somehow or the other there will be a genetic mutation and finally we bridge the gap between apes and human. No, no, really, really, I got the book there. I got the book. That's what you are. That's what you are. Why? Because you refuse to accept that someone has created you. Why? Because your current biology, your current physiology, your current any aspect of science uh, doesn't conclusively prove that God exists. Do you understand? This is the challenge of the era, and really, in this day and age out there, uh, people can't find the answers in the Quran. And this is a concern. Why? The Quran is not meant to be read, you know, in the very same way that you and I would read any other book. The Quran is a very challenging book. Right? It gives you all the answers, but just like I've told you on numerous occasions, it's like joining the dots of the constellation of the stars. Right? And that's what's important. And if you're not asking the right question, and if you're not searching for it in the Holy Quran, the way you have to you know, mine and find those little uh, you know, nuggets of gold or whatever it is, you're not going to get your answers. But if you, you do it, and if, you, and if you do it with a critical mind, and if you do it, not critical, but an analytical mind, Right? and apply yourself to these verses and open yourself up to a different form of, of acquiring knowledge, which is not in its, you know, what, what, it's not what, it's in what we call a sequential form, but in a knowledge which is, which is, which, which, which is divergent on so many levels, right? and challenges you on every level from the term or from the perspective of language to the perspective of, of the usage of words to the perspective of history, geography, all of it in one sequence, and you're trying to make sense of how all of this is connected together. That's the greatest challenge of the Holy Quran. Because if it was like, you know what, like the, you know, they started off with the Bible, you know, uh, uh, you know in the, what, what, uh, the first book of Genesis, right? and, and you know, God said be and there was light. Also, I can't remember the exact words of Genesis, but anyway, that's where they started. As if, you know what, God starts off his story like, to say, yeah, here it is from the beginning. This is how it all started off, and then towards the end, and they live happily ever after the end. That's not Quran for you. That's not Quran for you. And the beauty of the Holy Quran is right, that without the messenger, the message doesn't make sense. And that's critical. Sahaba Ikram took the Islam from the messenger. Then the message. Reason being, up until about plus minus 40 days before the Prophet ﷺ left the dunya, you know, the last verse was revealed. And 40 days later or so, plus minus, the Prophet ﷺ passed away. So up until tw for 22 years, and, or 23 years, or whatever it is, right, there was no complete Quran. Did you understand this point? There was no complete Quran up until 40 days before the Prophet of Allah passed away. So up until then, the Sahaba Kiram relied solely and totally and completely upon the tongue of the Holy Prophet and the guidance of the Holy Prophet Muhammad and the truthfulness of the Holy Prophet because everything else hinged around him. Everything hinged around him. Up until the, the last 40 days of the life of the Prophet of Allah no one knew that the Quran was completed. The Prophet of Allah didn't tell you, well, finally, this is the last verse of Revelation. Right? No. He didn't say that. He, he just received the final revelation and that was it. And if Allah will, He could have given him one final revelation one day before that. Why am I putting this point across? What if 
on two days before the Prophet may come down from the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in infinite wisdom decided to send down one decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which may have uh, abrogated, so to speak, in inverted commas, uh, three, four laws of Islam that they had been practicing for so long. Do you understand? Do you understand the gravity and the importance of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in terms of wahi? In terms of wahi, this is why sometimes you know I just laugh at people who deny who deny the eligibility of hadith, who deny who deny the importance of hadith, who deny the authenticity of hadith, and so on. They ask him, Baba, Hadrat is telling me where you got your Quran from, Baba? Where you got your Quran from? <coughs> All that you say is a revealed book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on the absolute truthfulness and the honesty of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is based on his character and his zaad. Do you know that? You have no idea and you have no guarantee na'udhu billah, astaghfirullah that the Prophet of Allah conceals something. You have no guarantee at all. You have no guarantee at all. Do you understand? Right? Moreover, then the people say, no, no, hadith, no, those people who are responsible for writing down and memorizing and putting together the verse of the do you know what are the criteria for every verse you must have two reliable truthful witnesses from the sahaba to, to correlate that you know this is a verse of the holy quran in terms of its you know in chapter and arrangement and this and that and something and so on and so on and so on and so on you needed two you needed two uh, okay, in modern science, even if you use the same methodology today in terms of the divinely revealed word, word why I'm putting this point across of those people who deny any, any legitimacy and authenticity of hadith? Two sahabis. That's it. That's it. The rest of it is blind faith on your part. The rest of it is blind faith on your part. That's it. One sahabi, one sahabi has the Khuzayma. You know the, the one verse, Read the Sunni Do you know there's only one Sahabi who knew that? And when it came to this verse, all the Sahaba Kiram had heard it, but they didn't have anybody who had it recorded, or they didn't have anybody you know that had proof of it that it had been revealed. Now, in terms of authenticity, they need an authentication. What do you do? Take the verse out. Do you know how this verse was placed in? On what basis? Sayyidina Khuzayma radiallahu ta'ala happened to, be, happened to be going past one day, right? When the Prophet sallallahu was engaging in a transaction between a non-Muslim and himself. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had, uh, had, had, had sold him off. Sold him off or purchased off? One of the two, right? And the next day the guy, the guy came and he, uh, you know, uh, he cancelled the transaction. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you know what, we, we, we shook on this. The deal was done. This and that and everything inside there, right? He said, where's your witnesses? Wait, so then he's making a big fuss. So as Khuzayma radiallahu ta'ala is walking past. So the Prophet, he asked the Prophet, what is wrong? He said, no, no, we, we, know, we, we had done a deal in terms of this horse or this animal or whatever it is. And today the guy comes and he, he cancels the deal. And he's asking me, where's the witness to the fact that he, 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 him and I had completed this transaction? So he said, so I have a testament to it. Yeah, you, you did this transaction with him. So the Kafir looked at him and said, yes, I'm his witness. The Prophet, the Prophet, the Prophet I did it. So the Kafir said, so the Prophet said, my witness says it. So the man said, okay, right, fine, they take, the, take the horse or whatever it is, and they, they complete the transaction. So the Prophet Allah said, but how is it possible? You were not here yesterday. You have no idea whether I did this transaction. You were not even present. He said, oh, Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala without seeing him based on your truthfulness and your tongue, Ya Rasulullah. Do you really think one horse is of any consequence? If you say it, it's done, but khatam. The Prophet of Allah said, oh, Khuzayma, as of today, your shahada will be regarded as true. Your shahada, your testimony will be regarded as two. So when this verse came out, Khuzayma was radiallahu ta'ala, he was the only one who had this verse. So the Sahaba came said, hey, hold on. He's according to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his testimony is what? Two. Done. Khalas. Do you understand the point I'm putting across? Very, 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 very critical. Right? When people tell me, I say, shh, right? just be careful. Because if I start questioning about the Holy Quran, <laughs> You start questioning your own faith after a while. So, yeah, you do you understand what I mean? Because when, who, who are these people? The same people who narrate the hadith are the same people who, who brought you to Quran. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Yes, yes, we all know that the rigorous thing of collection and the modu ahal, we all know that. But you're talking about the, the chain of narrative from the top, the Sahaba Ikram? Oh, yeah. 
Be very careful. Okay, now let's go to the other aspect of this verse. Here we're speaking about all the, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of the ahkamat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed and the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is beyond comprehension. But what I found interesting in this kitab here is that in Madarij al which is a book written by one of the greatest scholars of hadith in the indo pakistan continent, and this is about 200 years ago or something. And Sheikh Abdul Haq Muhaddid Dehlam, he's got a kitab called Madarij al He says that he, he's of the opinion that this also refers, Kalimatu Rabbi, right, refers also to a certain degree and actually is, and, and is also alludes to the greatness and the excellence of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because in terms of everything of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's creation, in terms of all the ilm of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, in terms of all the decrees of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, in terms of all the commandments of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, in terms of all the laws of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and everything that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is in control of, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his greatest creation. And in terms of greatness, in terms of magnificence, in terms of excellence, in terms of favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in terms of the inch Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him, in terms of the excellence, the excellent virtues that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him, in terms of the human perfection which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, human perfection which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted him, in terms of any aspect of createdness which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you were to take the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the greatest manifestation and the greatest masterpiece of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, and if you were to try to, to attempt to, to gain an idea of how great the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, how immense the, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, how, 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 how vast Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's might and power and his authority is, then he says the greatest way to do that in terms of a limited capacity would be able to just look at the, at the perfection, at the excellence, at the virtues of the, of the, of the, the prophethood, of the risala, of the nubuwa, of the mahbubiyat, of the akhlaq, the character, and every aspect of the, of the, every dimension of the personality of the Holy Prophet Muhammad 